let's see. This hangout air is hangout on air is live. Okay, awesome. Let's wait for people to get on here. Muting that. Hmm. Okay. Okay, people are starting to say hi. You do you see the chat? I see the chat. Okay. So, double checking the light. <laughs> <laughs> My hair is, is is correct, right? This is your hair fine. <laughs> Oh my goodness. I just woke up, so I'm like, I'm still waking up. It's nine o'clock in the evening. So. I know. Well, I, it's 12 noon on a weekend, and I don't normally wake up this early on the weekend. <laughs> well, I, I always wake up with my kids because they're so uh, <laughs> early. Yeah. We have, we have some little girls upstairs that start making noise, but I've gotten used to them, so I just like, Sleep right through it. <laughs> cool. So I see people are uh, finding it now. Yep, we got people. Oh, Jackie. Oh, I'm glad you were able to make it. Thanks for coming, Jackie. Jackie's Moon River Bettas. Yep. So, Victor's here. Got Danny's Aquariums, Life with Pets, Adventure Bettas. Hello, everybody. Juan is here. Bang Tao is here. <laughs> So we'll just wait um, a little bit, let people filter in, find their way here. <laughs> Hello from Costa Rica. Wow, Demi Games, that's awesome. Just waiting for people to wake up. Welcome, Costa Rica. You know, you, you are on the live stream. You can just I can just that. talk, huh? <laughs> I forget that. <laughs> you can just talk. I was clicking, but I can just I can just talk and people hear me. Yeah. Okay, so you while we're waiting for people to like filter in from their respective areas, would you like to do a brief introduction of yourself? Oh, I mean, no. I could introduce. You, but, yeah. So know. I'm uh, I'm Joop van Ness. I'm from the Netherlands. I'm uh, 38 years old, and uh, I'm a better hobbyist. So um, my Background is uh, I'm a biologist, also a scientist, former scientist, now a teacher in school, um, and I'm really interested in uh, in the genetics of the betas, but also really working with the line. So I do selective breeding with my fish on a hobbyist uh, way. So I have an entire fish room and try to make the best of it and share a lot with everybody. <laughs> Awesome. And how long have you been working with Betas? Uh, it's now 15 years. Um, 15 years mm -hmm. uh, I'm working with Betas. Yep. So. And then do you have any special events that are happening maybe in August soon? Well, and it, <laughs> it's a, <laughs> what a coincidence. Yes, we, we do. We, um, every year we in, in the Netherlands we organize uh, the Holland Beta Show, uh, which is uh, held in August uh, during the Holland uh, uh, Koi Show, which is one of the biggest Koi Shows in the world. Um, and we are there with uh, well, one of the big, well, actually it is the biggest uh, uh, better show in, in, in Europe with only uh, European bred fish. So we do not allow imports. We only want uh, import fish or self-bred fish to be uh, shown at this uh, show. And uh, yeah, this time 50 hobbyists from uh, 13 different countries will be pre uh, present, present there. So, yep, looking forward. <laughs> what date is that? I wish I could go. That would be so cool. One of <laughs> well, I, I wish you, uh, you will be able to, to do uh, one day. Uh, it will be the 18th uh, to the 20th of August. Okay. So, so yeah. August 18th to the 20th. And if you want to link that in case, it seems like we've got some people from crazy all over the world. I'll put it in uh, <laughs> Sorry, yeah. the link is in there. <laughs> oh. This is amazing. Look at this chat. We got people from Malaysia, Indiana, Russia, Norway, Detroit Rock City. This is amazing. Love it. Yeah, so if you are in the area and want to check out an awesome, um, is the Betas for All Betta Show? Yeah, um, it's a long Betta Show, yeah. 
Yeah. Then uh, August 18th to 20th. Like somehow I cannot link put the website in these. Uh, mm. I wow, think wait, I you're not uh, a lot. I understand. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. One second. Uh, there you go. You have been given the wrench. So go ahead, you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so. Now yeah, you can run around works, on my panel. <laughs> <laughs> Put all my links there. <laughs> so, yeah. so it looks like we have a really nice bunch of people tuning in. Yeah, this is Looking great. Well, um, welcome, people. <laughs> really nice of you to join to join to join us all. Yes, on this lovely Sunday. It's it's still Sunday over there, right? It's still Sunday. Yeah, for uh, three, three more hours. <laughs> Yeah. Three more hours. Oh my goodness. Yeah, that's and again, that's why we choose this time period so that we can try and like, you know, we're both awake. <laughs> we're both on the same day. Well, you're you're on coffee, I think. So. Yeah, I'm just beginning my day, and Yoop is just finishing. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so let's see if we can uh, answer some nice questions and get some yeah. nice topic running. Open this up. So we had a question already on the other one. I'm sorry, I had to figure out how to do a, a Hangouts thing. I couldn't figure out, what was the other one? It was like, um, it was, was on the question, old. Uh, yeah, it was a question, what, what would you get if you cross a royal blue to a koi bed? What okay. would be the outcome? So, you wanna, you wanna do this? <laughs> me? You wanna I'm answer? Yeah? Boy. yeah, me, right. Um, I'm looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will, I will try. Well, that will be a difficult one because, um, well, with the koi bed, as we, these are basically marbles, so we don't really know what what you will get. I mean, the color which you see phenotypically might not be how the fish uh, started. So it can start as a completely different color and end up, um, yeah, in, in in the phenotype you you, you will see at the, at the end. Uh, so when you cross them, you also really don't know what will happen. So crossing even a royal blue to a koi beta uh, doesn't uh, you, you don't really know what color will will, will happen. I mean the, the the blotches of the different colors will, will might not even be blue. Uh, so it will be uh, it will be a, a trial and error thing. So of course you can try. You might lose the the koi pattern in a in a generation, but it will pop up somewhere, and that, that will be working the line. So that will yeah, be, um, oh sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No. You, what do you want to say? Well, I was just saying, like, a lot of people think the marble is almost insidious in that it it just pops up in random areas whenever you breed it into a solid. Like, say you breed a marble fish into a solid line, it can hide for generations and then come back, right? Yeah, exactly. So exactly. A lot of solid um, beta breeders are like, oh, my gosh, this marble, where did it come from? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's nowadays. I mean, there's a lot of people love marbles, and and I think these are the well here in Europe at least they are the biggest classes in the shows. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. Yeah. But this this was completely different when you go back, well, ten, fifteen years ago. I mean, when I went to shows then, uh, I mean, people would even stop lines because they <laughs> they had a marble in a solid line, you know, and they would they would almost stop a line because they they thought it was polluted with marble. Well, I think that's a bit exaggerated because I think you can definitely work around that. Uh, but it, it is uh, uh, it is something which can pop up somewhere. And even if you uh, select for the solids, I mean, don't be surprised if so at some point some marble will pop up. Um, see a question, so marble is simple recessive. I think that's a bit too easy. Uh, yeah, definitely not. Uh, yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's actually quite dominant, I think, but it's... The expression of this this gene is a bit strange because it's what well, we think it is a transpo transposon. Uh, I don't really know. I mean, it, it hasn't been proved to my knowledge, but uh, it, it seems to work like a jumping gene. Um, and this is something which originally was described by uh, Barbara, Barbara McClintock, I think it was in yeah. mice. Yeah. In so it's, it's actually yeah. in plants, in corns, mm -hmm. corn. Um, and that's something where you get. Yeah, the gene can actually interrupt other color genes by jumping into it. 
and so it will interrupt the color formation because different proteins will um, be expressed um, and that that will um, each shell will actually get a, a sort of a random color pattern and that will be uh, that's actually the result of the phenotype that we see so it's not, it's not um, like completely random though like well, when you look at like, marble fish as they change over time yeah. it's like yeah. the patches kind of move around the fish in a way it's like well, the random, I mean, I mean, uh, that, that it seems to be like that in a certain area you also you will get a uh, the same color but you can get at some point you can get uh, some part of the fish it can be black on the head it can be red you can have yellow you can have all different colors next to it so it will not be that it will be a uniform color change to the whole body so in that sense you're definitely right it's not that random but it is it seems to be that that cells which are close together i mean seem to have a bit of a similar expression somewhere uh, yeah that's in, 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 in budget sorry Oh, sorry. I was just saying it's so interesting to me that there's like the, it, is. it appears as if there's that cell to cell signaling, but only yep. cell contact. That's called like paracrine signaling, right? Where yep. it's like they're right yep. next to each other. So whatever it is, um, some type of junctions which are into connection with each other. Yeah, seems to be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, that question, although it seems simple, is actually quite complex. <laughs> it is. It is. Well, it's simple in the sense that to say that. You don't, we don't know exactly what will happen. That's the, actually the, 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 the fastest answer. Uh, but it will be very interesting to try. I mean, I know some people here in Europe who have actually crossed koi fish to non-koi fish, and then they were able to get koi back. But it will take two or three generations, again, to fix this. And, and this is not, uh, not something which will, um, yeah, that's not easy. I mean, the koi seems to be a little bit different than the normal you know, the classic marbles which we know. I mean, there seems to be some add-on marble. It's a marble plus or something like that. It, it Maybe, yeah. I don't know, Dalmatian in there. I don't know exactly what it is. But there yeah. is something more in there. Sorry, I think there's a little bit of a lag. So like, whenever I start talking, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I sometimes interrupt you, but I don't mean to. Like, no problem, no problem. It's just the lag. But anyway, I just wanted to say, um, I think uh, Creative Pet Keeping has been doing this phenomenal like she's been documenting every step of the process of her breeding mm -hmm. her koi betas. And I love it because you can see uh, in her one spawn just this incredible variation. You have solids, you have um, a small, smaller proportion of bettas that have the classic koi look, um, mm -hmm. you know, the super high, high contrast marbling. You have um, some of her fish are completely like cellophane, like completely clear. Yeah. So, um, and then, yeah. um, her, I love hers because she's documented every step of her fish. So you, you should check out her channel. I actually became a member uh, today. A member? <laughs> <laughs> well, I subscribed, or how do you say a it? A member of the Creative Pet Cube. I'm a member. I, I, I subscribed. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. That's awesome. So I subscribed to the channel also because I, 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 I was looking around there. So it looked really nice. But it's interesting to see that a lot of these um, koi's actually, they start out as solids. And then they mm -hmm. become completely cellophane, and then they color back, and they get these color patches, which are completely different than the original solid color which was there. And th this is, I think, a very yeah unique thing, which is completely different than what we see with the marbles. I mean, with the yeah. classic marbles, they're usually when you have a blue fish, they turn blue white, or they become completely white, but that's it. You know, or they turn back to blue. But these are the colors which are then there, and it's not that suddenly some red pops up or yellow or something like that. And with the koi's, this seems to be more complex. So there seems to be a different way of, yeah, genetic uh, background, which is a timeline in yeah. a way. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. It's like a good wine. They uh, they mature when they get older, right? They, it becomes better. Yeah. They, they get more blotches. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Goodness. OK, that was a great conversation. I like that one. I wonder if she'll pop up later. So I saw her, I, I saw that she tuned in somewhere. In the okay. But, Let's see. Right. Uh, so one other thing, guys, um, in this conversation, because we're talking about relatively like deep genetic technical stuff, if there's something that you don't understand, then just ask. Because like sometimes we forget. Like we'll drop a word like phenotype, you know. And so phenotype is what you actually see on the fish like with your eyes, and then genotype is what the fish is carrying. So 
Um, they may not necessarily look koi, but they could be carrying koi genes and be able to pass it on to their offspring. But so guys in the chat, uh, if there's something that you don't understand, just ask and we will make it clear. And then um, second, because we're going like so in depth into topics, we might not get to every question because we kind of want to like flush it completely out. We want to like have a good conversation right. about it, you know? Gee, how can, how can I show a picture again in this? How do you, uh, how do you show a picture? Uh, yeah. Go to, hold on, I forget, one second. <laughs> Kind of problem. There was I, I know there was this uh, option. <laughs> oh, screen share. Okay. Yeah, so that's what I mean. Yeah. Share and then application window. Okay. Where do I see it? Uh, it's on the left side. Yeah. If you hover your cursor to the left side, um, ah. it's icon second from down. Ah, yeah. Green arrow. Screen yeah. Share. I, I will show you something. This is from. Um, a breather phone because I think it nicely connects. I showed it on Facebook uh, actually today or yesterday, I think. Yeah, I just did. Yeah, just yesterday. But I will um, let me see. Do you see this now? Yeah. So I I I have um this is an example from a, a reader from Germany, Alex Alex Grimm, and she's uh, working. She's doing a really nice job on these koi uh, koi marbles, and she had a really nice example because she also made these these pictures of these fish in time and here you see a fish which is uh where the, this koi marble pattern actually progresses in time so first you see it's 10 weeks old and it's actually a blue red well a, a multicolor fish um and then interestingly it turns well it almost loses all the the blue color it turns almost red with some light of patches becomes cellophane with red and black and then it starts to gain color when it's 22 to 25 weeks old and the red becomes actually more prominent and you see this more classical koi pattern and this is uh i think really interesting uh to watch and if you compare that to uh to for instance a normal model that's completely different um yeah wow um, that's really beautiful it is it is it is and well, i mean this is more the, the well this is an example for one of my own fish and this fish actually started blue red in the beginning so it was like a bit of a from a salamander kind of line, um, and this fish also well you see it to up to a year old, um, and you see that interestingly also the first the fish becomes almost well a bit of a pastel, so it's still there the iridescence is still there, but the black layer is completely gone, and you see then that the blue patches change into time, and then when it's 28 week old, so almost half a year, you see that. Um, well, over half a year, you see that the red actually starts to appear again. And when it's then a year old, you see that the red is still is, is completely back. Uh, but it's completely different than uh, the original color where it started from. But unfortunately, I don't have any pictures from before for 15 weeks. But this might give, give an impression at least. Let me see if I can go back. Sorry, I'm back. Yeah, you're back, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's so cool. Like, and and then, have you ever had this happen? Um, like a like a solid like I um. Oh my gosh, this happened to one of your fish, one of the males that I brought back of yours. Remember? Like, the red. Yeah, the red. He went from solid red to, and then um, he got like clear, like the mosaic pattern, just like poof overnight. It was mm -hmm. really strange. <laughs> Yeah, well, that that sometimes happens. I mean, in my red line, I see it once in a while that the fish becomes um, yeah, that it also loses color, and you get this really uh, well. One 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 out of hundred becomes cellophane, but that's really really rare. And um, but I do get once in a while these two twiler kind of marbles where they uh, become um, yeah a bit of uh, how do you say it inverse butterfly. Um, mm -hmm. Let me, let yeah. me see if I can find a, a picture quickly. Uh, this is, let me show you a quick, a quick, uh, picture quick. Um, Are you looking for a picture? Yeah, I found it actually. This is a, this is a, an example of a, this was a completely red dark bodied male actually, but he turned, well, you see that the, the inner part of the finish became, um, well, colorless. And he, ch he, sta he stayed like this for, uh, for a while. He actually went to a show like this and then, uh, yeah, he went to uh, a friend of mine in Germany to work with, and he, I, I think he wanted to cross it into the koi line. I'm not sure. Um, 
I haven't I have not been updated yet, but that might be interesting. So. Yeah, wow. That would be yeah. really really crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Huh. The sky's the limit, huh? We better like double marble. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, are you happy with how we covered this topic, or should we uh, grab another question? I'm, 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 I'm happy. I mean, I hope people are happy. I, I don't know what the people would like to, would like us to talk about. I see a uh, question from um, Joseph. He's. This is an interesting one. How do I achieve green? Have you first off? Have you ever seen a green beta? You well, I've seen a green beta. Uh, phenotypically, yes. Genetically, uh, that's a bit of a challenge thing because, well, I think there are m multiple ways to get a green phenotype. So a fish which looks green uh, can be achieved in different ways. I mean, that, that's my opinion. What's your opinion? <laughs> ah, it's hard because what do you define as green? Right? It's also a good like, one. There's yeah. that green too. Because like I've seen Richie. a Your lot of points that look green to me. Like they're like this green, right? But yeah. But but kind of metallic y light green. And then but then like dark forest green, grass green. You know? So um, it's yeah, tough. It. Well, I think I I mean when you look at, at the I mean I always hear that, that there used to be really good green fish. Uh, in the past, and, and um, well, I wasn't there in the past, so I cannot really judge on that. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I'm talking then in the 80s or the, the 70s, so I read a lot of, like, uh, when the breeders who are in, in this hobby for way longer than we both are, uh, they sometimes say, like, yeah, we used to have really, really, really good green lines, but, yeah, sadly, they have been lost. Most of the times, also not really good pictures because, yeah, this was a different time. I mean, nobody was there, and not everybody could just grab a cell phone and just make a picture or a video and just share it on the internet like we do these days. Um, that's sad sometimes because a lot of, yeah, a lot of things has, has been lost that way. Mm -hmm. um, I do believe that when you, yeah, that 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 a lot of these when they when they say that they breathe through, I mean, they almost have to be from a turquoise kind of line, so they have to be turquoise based. Maybe even the metallic influence. Uh, not knowingly that they actually were breathing with metallic. And, and, yeah. and that might be the case, but exactly, yeah, as I said, I'm not, I wasn't there, so it's, it's difficult, uh, difficult for me to, to say how, what is the genetic background of these fish. The only thing I can say that, and I'm looking actually for a few pictures which I can show. Um, so give me a, I'm talking a bit in between. Uh, <laughs> uh, because what, what, I'm, what I've been working with with my own lines is that when I, uh, cross metallic into into the lines. Then I, at some points I, I, I did get um, I did get green fish. So I did, did get several green fish in my lines. Um, but they bright turquoise. I think that's what Joseph means. He's he clarifies here. Well, I mean turquoise are emerald colors. So mm -hmm. yeah, the influence of the metallic does give it a really bright green sheen. So yeah, so, so I'm I'm actually looking at some. Um, uh, I can show you a, a few pictures of what the closest greens I had myself. Um, oh, so, so while you're looking, I'll answer yeah, yeah, Martin sorry. Rogers. Do metallic greens change with lighting? And they definitely do. <laughs> like a lot of beta colors change with what kind of lighting that you yeah. have over the fish. Like um, flor fluorescent lighting can give a different sheen. Uh, incandescent versus the bright white LED versus all kinds of different things. That's why, um, hold on, now I'm going to look for something. <laughs> oh, yeah. So that's why I spent like a ridiculous amount of money to get like this particular flashlight. Not ridiculous amount. It was like 35 US dollars. <laughs> but like, um, <laughs> I love this flashlight because it's got like a CRI of 92, which means that it's as it's really quite close to daylight. So um, whenever you're judging fish, you wanna use an LED that's like as close to daylight as possible, like true light. I don't know, you put, did you spend a lot of money on a, on a flight? On lights, no, I didn't spend a lot of money on lights. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I saw this light and I had to get it because, um, you know, it's close to daylight and I feel like it gives me the best, like representation of the animals quote unquote correct color because it's like daylight, like natural light. So um, anything higher than 92 CRI is like super expensive. You know? 
I think I think light is definitely important. I mean, when you make a picture as well, I mean, it's important. I think that you try to picture the fish, um, yeah, the way you see the fish, and it's not like sometimes you see a copper fish, which then suddenly on the picture turns purple, and we say, hey, we have a purple fish. Really nice, maybe nice to sell your fish, but it's not the fish which the people will get and receive when they buy it. So maybe something to think about <laughs> if, yeah, you, if you do that, and also to be critical. I think when you when you are buying fish. That, that that sometimes some colors are too good to be true. I think. Um, <laughs> did you find your picture? <laughs> I, I did. I did. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to. Actually, I'm going to my um, my spawn log. Um, so you see this now. This is um, a while ago. Um, this is uh, in 2012, and I crossed a, uh, a black dragon with a metallic blue fish from myself, which was yeah from metallic blue. And it had a, word, word, a very bad top line here, but that actually was was um, contracted by by the female, uh, which was from my own line. Well, these fish looked kind of green, and you can actually look at these well, when you look at the background. They are royal blue. Uh, well, so there's royal blue and turquoise in there. Um, and when you look at the fish, they they see they have some greenish hints, but also blue. So it's a bit of a you see a variation among the offspring um, and this female already looked yeah, kind of green on the body but with bluish finish with bluish uh, finish um, when you go to this when i use this female to a black dragon male uh, and in my opinion this male is then this is actually copper based so this is metallic with a dragon influence and then uh, homozygous for the steel gene when you cross when i cross these together um, the offspring, um, well, interestingly, had a bit more prominent metallic layer uh, from the from the dragon uh, influence from the father. But when you look at the well, the colors of some of them, they were really, yeah, as you can see, really uh, green. Um, but there were differences in in the color types. So, which, in my opinion, would say that the mother must have been royal blue based, because I see two different types uh, back. Um, but it, it might be, I might be wrong here. Uh, it might also be a different kind of expression. Uh, I, did, I did not get copper, so that might be against my what I just said. Um, but this is always a bit of a, a... Sorry? You didn't get copper. And not from this, so that, that would be against what I just said. That would make the mother maybe more, more a turquoise and would, would make the spawn actually royal blue based. Mm. Um, so, Actually, well, because when they would have been, when she would have been royal blue based, um, I would have expected uh, that the copper would, a copper phenotype would pop out, and that did not happen. So all these fish were greenish blue in a different, you even see a marble, so in a different way. Um, and of course, I mean, they are all they are all pictured with the same light, so you still see that there is a difference in the way their um, reflection is and the way their iridescent layer. Uh, is, uh, in the phenotype, but these even fish how are the uh, fish tilts can change sorry? The shade. Sorry, even how the fish tilts in the light can yeah. change the shade. Yeah, it's yeah, metallic. Yeah, but it's. Um, I mean, this is the closest I personally got to green. Um, yeah, in, in, but but these fish do not read true. I mean, they did not give me all greens or something like that. So it's different from well the old type of green where. People used to talk about if that really bred true because that's not the case in, in, in with the fish I just showed. So back. <laughs> that's awesome. That is a beautiful color. Well, I think so. <laughs> it is a great color. Yeah, I mean, and I think it's also great to work with these, um, yeah, with the, with these with these metallics in combination with these blue uh, genotypes so, and genotypes. Yeah. Yeah, that and that's a whole nother conversation too. Like the uh, metallic layer and how it got integrated into the bettas, all the different yeah. colors. And... For sure. Oh, look, Karen is here. Hi, Karen. <laughs> Hi, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay. Um, you want to grab another question or do you want to like open up yeah. the box of worms about metallic? <laughs> I think we let's, should probably let's do know. some questions. Let's do yeah, some let's questions. See what people would like us to, to discuss. Yeah, let's try and stick with the chat. Let's see. Um, uh, Karen says, "Howdy, kids." 
<laughs> okay, we got some side conversation here about feeding yep. Dennis. That's excellent. Okay. Um, Yoop is actually who I got the um, Basilier's Biofish food idea from. So I need more of that, by the way. Oh, you need <laughs> more of that. So I need to send you some. Okay. <laughs> I need some. I don't have any more. No problem. Okay. Um, let's see. How do What's I read the <laughs> What? There's a question, how do you breathe from Metallica? Metallica. <laughs> so that's... Uh, you wanted, so how do you wait, you'd have to do the thing again. You just... You have to do that and stand in front of your tank. <laughs> and then sing. Uh, <laughs> sing one. No, it's a, that's a really good question. I mean, uh, how to breathe from Metallica? I think that, that you have to have uh, breathers which, um, uh, which already... Um, uh, ca are carrying the treat, so you have to work with uh, a treat. It is right. <laughs> it's, <laughs> trait. <laughs> it's trait, right? It's yeah, not sorry. Treat. It's trait. Yeah. You, uh, <laughs> Jan, sorry, Jan already corrected me in the previous chats. I have to say trait. Excuse <laughs> me for my uh, Dutch uh, dialect. <laughs> I'm doing my best, <laughs> but it, it's good to. Um, to work with uh, fish which already are carrying a uh, metallic so and then you have to see if they are already homozygous or heterozygous that means that they're carrying one or two copies and i think it's also depending on what do you want exactly what uh, do you want multicolors do you want to have solid colors um and you can go all the way i mean you can even breed reds with the metallic layer uh, you can breed blues with a metallic layer uh, depends on what's the you know what's your goal yeah, hold on. I'm pulling up a cartoon yep. just to illustrate. And I think this will tie into another question that I saw in the chat. Hold on. Yep. Um, <laughs> anyway, the fact that, well, now this color layer, now I don't like this anymore. <laughs> I liked it like before it. when I first made it. Hold on. Um, I made a cartoon on color layers, but now I don't like it anymore because we're going to, we can actually talk about why it's a bad diagram now. <laughs> it's totally good. So I made this a long time ago. It was based on um, um, oh, yeah. based on another diagram. Let's see. I put the citation here. Adapted from Basic Color Genetics of Betas by Chris Yu, which was an mm -hmm. older article, but I changed it a little bit based on my then understanding of the color layers that we see on the scale. So imagine that you're looking at this, and this is like a single scale on the beta, okay? And so like on top, like quote quotations on top, I put dragon metallic opaque because that seems to be an upper layer. And then you have iridescent, the black, red, and yellow. But we can talk about how I no longer like this diagram. <laughs> Why do you don't like it anymore? Because, and then um, this ties into the question, um, that Mackenzie is asking differences between copper dragon and opaque. Uh -huh. The fact that uh -huh. they're, me... different, they're different fours, they're different pigments, right? Yeah. So oh. we have like, what? You, sorry. No, no, continue, please. It's I'm, like. I'm looking for some things as well, and you first continue what you, what you want to explain. Okay. It's like, so we have dragon metallic and opaque, and these tend to cover up all of the other color layers below it because they form such thick deposits of pigment. And one thing I don't like is that opaque actually is an accumulation of guanophores, which I put down here on the iridescent layer. That's incorrect. So guanophores should be up here with opaque. But what these, like guanophores, iridophores, all this stuff, and then they found a particular one for metallic. I think you, you're going to talk about that maybe? Yeah, but, but aren't these in the same layer, don't you think? That they are actually the iridescent, that they are actually in the same layer? Because they're just different crystalline strict structures on, on, on the plate. That are bending the light differently? Yeah, that's what yeah. I believe now. So that's why I dislike this. Because phenotypically, yeah. it looks like this, where if you have these different layers, they tend to show up more, but they're actually in the same layer. They're just bending light differently. Yeah. Uh, anyway, you, you go ahead. Um, 
how do I get out of this? Oh, I clicked stop sharing. <laughs> you just jump stop sharing. Right back. Wait, okay, I can uh, I can okay. show you a little bit. Did, did, okay. I will show I will show you something. Um, I made a thing on a presentation once, and it might give a little bit of an impression how how this this expression of of it also is not maybe completely correct, but let me give a. Uh, so do you see this? Um, so you see here iridescent colors. And here below, I made a, a kind of a color cell. And in these color cell, this is an iridophore. So you see iridescent. Um, and, and on these, in these iridescent cells, there are all crystalline uh, plates. And these are structures which reflect light. So basically, when you get some light which falls in, uh, and I hope this now works. Um, yeah, so light falls in, as you can see. And when light falls in, um, it, the, the structure and the form of these different uh, plates will actually uh, cause this light to reflect completely different. So what will happen is that um, our perception, our color perception, will also be different. Uh, so you can imagine that when you have different of these crystalline plates, you'll also see a different, a different color perception depending on the shape of these different plates. So, um, and this is a bit, sorry, I'm going through that a bit faster. So when you go now, for instance, to uh, to, and I think I showed this maybe before already once, but um, let's do this again. When you see this is a non-metallic steel blue fish, and this doesn't have any copy of a uh, copy of the metallic uh, trait. So when you now put in one copy of the metallic trait, you will see that this this fish, and of course they're they're photo, they're pictured in different lights. Uh, uh, but what you can see here, the color is here really steelish steelish blue. But when you look at the heterozygous metallic steel blue, you can already see that in some parts, in, in, in the anal fin, but also in the caudal and in the ventral fins, you see copperish kind of, um, yeah, a copperish kind of phenotype. And when you look at these original articles, which were written by, I think, uh, Leo Bruce, uh, she, she, he actually showed that, that when you looked into the, and I think it was Dr. Rosalind Upson or something, she showed uh -huh. into the, she showed into, into the, under the microscope that when you look at these fish, which is heterozygous metallic steel blue, that you can already see um, that the phenotype is actually turning into a copper. When you now put in a different another metallic uh, 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 gene, so you, so you make actually in homozygous metallic steel blue, the phenotype of this fish is turning copper. So you see that when you put on top of the steel blue phenotype, uh, which we all know very well because it's already around for, for many, many, many years. Um, when you put two copies of this metallic trait uh, on top of that, you see that the phenotype completely changes. And that, but the basis is still steel blue. And that's interesting because that actually is caused by the fact that these crystalline plates are causing uh, the light to reflect in a completely different way. And now we see a copper fish instead of a steel blue. So I hope this maybe explains a little bit what is going on with these color perception and what, what we see, but also the link with what is going on genetically, because genetically this is still a steel blue. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, it's just like quote unquote hiding. Yeah. You know, which yeah. is why the cartoon of the layers exactly. you know, kind of makes sense. Yeah. And here, um, you as you were talking about that, I pulled out this paper that I have yet to fully read and put on, but I found it um, a couple of years ago. It's uh, chromatophores and color revelation of the blue variant of the Siamese fighting fish, and they used mm -hmm. a light and electron microscopy. Hold on, let me, oh my gosh, how do I do this again? I think I have to share the entire screen. Okay, so. <laughs> yeah. So here, um, yeah. this is published in Micron. So here's just a light microscope. You see the overlapping scales, mm -hmm. okay? We're gonna go in even further. So this is um, from the caudal fin, okay? So we're gonna go even further. Here's a side. So they took a section of the fin. So you can see like the gray, okay? And then uh, the different layers on either side. And here's where it gets cool. So these are electron micrographs. So using a, an electron microscope, um, mm -hmm. you can see, like visualize very, very tiny structures. And um, here's a melanosome, okay, and melanophores. So melanophores, this is the black layer, the black pigment is concentrated inside of these structures here. Certainly. Which is cool, right? <laughs> and then 
Uh, here we're going to see more. Here's a melanophore uh, here, and you can see that it's actually quite large because mitochondria are kind of around it. Okay. But anyway, this, this is what gives your fish color here, these little sacks of pigment, basically. And then um, he does some really cool experiments where he, like, bathes it in different um, saline solutions and causes the melanophores to move around. Because sometimes if your fish is stressed, they turn more pale, right? And then they also, it appears as if they get more colorful. Um, and the fish can actually control that. But anyway, this is what it looks like. This is where your fish's pigment comes from. So uh, how do I stop? Okay, there we go. Yeah. So I don't know, I thought it was really pretty. Yeah, that's, that's the interesting part with these things, what you just said with these um, stress stripes, right? I mean, this is, I mean, when you have a dark body fish, all these fish have these black stripes on the side. But normally when the fish is not stressed, you see that this, this is covered. So that is because of the color spreads within these different cells. And you see that these stripes, the stripes are completely covered. But when you um, stress the fish, you will see that uh, the color gets more concentrated inside the cell. And if it goes actually together, um, and it's less distributed within the cell. And then you see this these stress stripes in the underneath layer coming up. So. They're there in every dark body fish. Mm -hmm. Correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> linking this paper. Oh, that's nice. Let me check. Hold on. I'm trying to link it, but apparently my typing is so loud that it goes back. <laughs> you say something, so I can like, so it focuses on you. <laughs> We want to have an online class on genetics. That's, oh, that's too much uh, credit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I put the paper in the chat. So um, let's see. Oh, here. How about we switch from color to form? So Demetrius has a really has some question. Um, uh, so it is known that we shouldn't cross double tail to double tail because of deformities. What kind of deformities? What is the percentage? Are the deformities the same when we cross double tail to double tail carrier, just with lower percentage in the spawn? Hmm. So I think that's a really, really nice question. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a really nice one. Um, I think, yeah, I think it's important. I think you should not. I mean, there are breeders, I think, who cross double tail to double tail without any problems. Uh, and I know a few of them as well who did this in the past, and that's not a, in that sense, not a problem at all. Um, I think that, there, of course, there is a, a, a bigger chance. I mean, what happens in these double tails, and that this is a nice, um, actually a nice thing. And I think we, we have seen some nice pictures on this um, last week also on Facebook. What is going on in these fish is, is, is a process called ventralization. And, and this means that actually the, um, it, it seems like there is a, in the midline of the fish, uh, a mirror image has been made. So there's been a. Uh, I'm grabbing the paper right now, you. Hold yeah, on. Okay, thanks. There's a translocation from, from basically the anal fin and, and the caudal fin towards the dorsal, so do, do it towards the back. So what you see on, on the back is basically more or less a copy, a copy of the anal fin. And there is a, a duplication of the caudal fin. Uh, so you often see in the spine that it's split at the peduncle area. Um, what you do get a lot with these fish is that they tend to look shorter. Um, and I, I fully agree with this question that it, this is something to, to keep in mind when you cross fish. I mean, the breeders who I know which, who have crossed double tail to double tail, they made sure that these double tails had really nice long bodies. Um, and they were not related. So they were actually fish which were not related to Yeah, this is the paper. Um, keep in mind that this is a paper where they are uh, looking at the developmental biology. So it's more, they're not looking at curved spines or something like that. They, they made a, um, what they did is that they made a staining, a staining of different, um, um, well, this is ZIG1 and ZIG4, I thought. Uh, so two, uh, um, yeah, two proteins, um, 
uh, in, in this case, which they try to uh, color and try to show in this picture. Um, and what you see here then in actually with the double tail, and let's see if I can, if you can, do you now see all this? Uh, everybody sees this now or not? Is this? Uh, they see it when I talk. Ah, so you talk. Because you're talking. Then you talk. So I talk. Because then it's, <laughs> but yeah. you have such a good, like, no, just, uh, yeah. Well, what <laughs> you say, you're, you're seeing this, um, this doubling of this protein that they think is causing this, like, mirror image of the bottom of the fish here. And whenever they stain it, you can really see that a double tail betta is literally a, a fish that's mirrored from bottom to top, right? So like exactly. here's a regular betta on top, okay? And you see that the dorsal fin has a much thinner base, okay? And then of course the one caudal fin. But whenever they stain like this double tail betta over here, oops, you can see that the dorsal fin is roughly of similar width to the anal fin. So it's literally been mirrored up on top. And then you have this split here and two caudal fins here, which they've outlined here using these right over here. And then you actually have a double up, a doubling of the lateral line up top here as well. Yeah, that's an interesting one. Yeah, that's, that's, very interesting. that's why they look wider, wider yeah. and shorter. Like if you compare these two here. Okay. It's very interesting that the double, the, 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 that line also was completely duplicated. Yeah, way up here, which is so strange. Yeah. <laughs> and we do <laughs> once in a while see these kind of in between types, eh? that where where they are not completely doubled. You see, like partial double tails in the sense that now here in in the, in the example which is shown by by GN, you see that the, that the, the there's a duplication of the number of rays also in the mm -hmm. caudal fin, uh, but this is not always completely distributed, uh, equally distributed. So uh, there can also be unequal double tails where you only see a few rays in the in the upper lobe. And a few and, and a lot and the normal amount of rays in the lower lobe. And this is also a matter of, of course, selective breeding when you're really aiming for show quality um, yeah, double tails. But the the shorter body to get back, I think, to the to the main question, I think, is is something definitely to look at. But not only with double tails. I think you also should should keep in mind that you um, that you look at this when you are working with double tail carriers. So when you are working with fish just single tail fish, which are carrying double tail, and you mm -hmm. keep on crossing white dorsals to white dorsals, I mean, you will also see that in your line, you will get, probably get some double tails, but you will also tend to get some shorter fish. So I think when you uh, try to select your uh, your breeders, always try to compensate um, the breeders. Huh? So look for, when you have a bit of a shorter male, look for a bit of a longer body type female. Or the other way around. In this way, you can really, um, yeah, really, um, I think, compensate this usually in the in the in the fry. Yeah. I that oh, the question a little bit. Yeah, and then um, whenever you work with double tail carriers, so yeah. this is just a. These are Stacy's fish. I'm not sure if Stacy's here, um, but this is like these are two our brothers. Okay. And then um, forgive me for like playing, like messing around with the, the letters. It doesn't really matter what letters it is as long as you know what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> but here we have like a, um, a single tail. So uh, like two copies of single tail and then a double tail carrier here. So you can see that the double tail carrying brother has more rays, 14 rays, compared to the single tail um, not DT carrying brother over here, which only has like 12 rays. And I mean, this thing can be carried forever, right? Like you could have yeah. fish that look single tail and have 12 or less rays and still be able to throw double tail. But this one, I mean, is pretty, um, you can be pretty sure that this one is carrying double tail if they have a lot of wide rays. So you could yeah. use this whenever you're working with double tails and you want to avoid some of the possibly deleterious effects of breeding double tail to double tail, you can go with the double tail carrying ones that have like 14, like more than 12 rays. I've never seen a fish with like 16 rays. Wait, actually, I can, no, I have. I can, well, I can show you something if you want. Yeah, um, but anyway, the, the carriers that are single tail but have wider dorsals, those, those guys are usually carrying stuff. 
Yeah. yeah, I can share you one uh, picture. Maybe this gives it a bit. Um, do you see oh, this? Yeah, yeah, look at you. So, so what do you see? Here? This is uh, excuse me because it, it's from a presentation in Dutch, which I gave at some aquarium club uh, some time ago um, in Belgium. But uh, I think what you can see is on the left. You see the black the black fish. Um, this is a nine ray dorsal fin. So when you look at the rays, the number of rays which sprout from well, from the back, you see that there are only nine rays. When we go down to the double tail, and this is a double tail pluck up, um, you see that there are actually 20 rays in the in the dorsal fin. So here you can really see if you draw a midline through this, uh, that you actually see a, have a copy of more or less of the anal, which is actually turned into uh, into the into the dorsal fin. And then there also the the caudal fin has been duplicated. So uh, without any doubt, here also this lateral line probably is also present. I mean, I haven't looked at that uh, at that time, but uh, this is actually nice to 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 look for. Um, when we then see the fish in the middle, this is a, a half moon pluck up, which was uh, 14 ray, um, so carrying double tail. And usually, I think everything which is bigger than than uh, nine or ten rays. Uh, can be carrier of double tail, um, and of course, when they are broader, I mean, the higher the chance, I think that they are also carrying it. Um, but also with double tail, this is a kind of an interesting uh, trait. I think it's not completely Mendelian. I mean, when you you can even cross two carriers, and you know that they are carriers because they both had, for instance, a double tail parent, and still, when you look at the offspring, you might not get double tails in the first in the first generation when you cross these fish. Uh, but it will pop up somewhere, but it's not. It seems to be not completely uh, Mendelian, like like yeah, that you can predict in the second generation you will get it back. I mean, at least that's my experience. But yeah, mine you, too. Yeah. yeah. So it's 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 a uh, it's an interesting trait because I think it's a uh, it's a valuable trait also to work with even when you are not interested in breeding um, double tails or breeding for double tails. Um, I think I personally am not the biggest fan of double tails. I mean, I, I really like to, to look at them, but I'm not really aiming my, my breeding program to, to breed more double tails. I mean, they pop up in my lines, but I usually work with uh, double tail carriers uh, to get more volume in the dorsal fin. Mm -hmm. um, and this is also something, also to get back to the main question, in that case, I also really have to look at the length of the bodies and that you uh, maintain enough length in, in your fish. And did you not not that you do not get fish or offspring which are too short in in body shape, and this is something which you always should look at in my opinion. Yeah, and then to get back to like what do the awful mutations and not awful mutations, what do the deformed fry look like? They look kind of sad, like the ones that are like really bad. The spine is like kinked, like yeah, can... like if you look down on the fish. It, it looks like a zigzag, like the fish got yeah. squished the wrong way, you know. Um, whenever you have, like, it, it's almost like the double tail gone wild. <laughs> you know, it's like they're so short because they look like they've been squished sideways. They look like a Z shape, like, um, like a really severe spinal scoliosis or twisting of the spine. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's really sad. Like, and a lot of the time those fish don't make it very long. Mm -hmm. So hold on, I'm looking. Are you looking for a picture? I'm gonna look for another question. Yeah, I have some. I you have some you. pictures of. Yeah, I have, yeah, I can wait. Give me a second. Okay. It's also from a presentation I gave a long time ago, but I did find it. Sorry, I mean it's also in Dutch, but that doesn't really matter. I think for the when you can see here that there are uh, well different forms. So here the hey, it's very very the, the body is very very stout very thick like um, compressed very, anyway. yeah, yeah very compressed you see some scale folds here as well that might be of different origin but uh, it almost looks like a molly when you look at this like a balloon molly um here you see that this is a curved back uh, so it's a severely curved uh, spine um here that, and this is something which we sometimes see also when you look at shows sometimes um fused fins so where the see the caudal fin this is phenotypically almost yeah, a, um, a double tail, because you see the, the broad dorsal also has really a, almost even um, amount of, of rays than, than the anal fin. You also clearly see that there is a, um, 
an, an increase in the number of rays in the cobalt fin, but it's still fused. And this is also what happens here. You even see or see a fuse between the cobalt fin and the anal fin. So this can, uh, yeah, this can all happen. And mm -hmm. This is something where we have to uh, always keep it. With this, we have to keep in mind uh, when we are working with double tails. Um, but still, I mean, it, to my experience, you can still get really nice double tails back from a fish which has not completely um, the perfect distributed lobes. Um, even if you um, are working with the carriers from such a, um, a spawn, you can still get really nice double tails down the line if you continue with working with these carriers. But it, Definitely, yeah. 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 So you can have a lot of, what we're trying to say is you can have a lot of intermediate expression. Exactly. Yeah. And then I just wanted to point out that this double tail um, in this paper that we looked at before, yeah. so this is in a zebra danio, the Medaka yeah. mutant they call it. So you yeah. can see that, you know, it doesn't just happen in bettas. So here yeah. you see mirroring of the bottom of this, um, of this fish on the top as well. And then it almost has like a trident tail look to it because of the doubling of the caudal fin again. So it's not just bettas that have this, this neat kind it's of... It's also goldfish. Uh, it's the same. I mean, the, the, oh, the goldfish, goldfish... Yeah, definitely. Yeah, the goldfish mutations, which we, which we know, we also see that the duplication of the tails, these triple tails, etc., they are all, um, yeah, because of a similar process. So duplication of certain, um, yeah, parts of the fins. Mm -hmm. And goldfish is a whole other thing. Yeah. <laughs> goldfish is... <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. Okay. Maybe somewhere in the, oh, this is maybe a nice one. Um, oh, Susan and Mr. Science Geek are here. Hi. Okay, sorry. <laughs> there's a question. Maybe someone here knows if black orchids breed true, like what can one expect from breeding matching ones? Um, well, that, do you have any experience with this, uh, G? The blacks? Uh, Sorry, the what? I'm trying to get the paper. I can answer it. Okay. No, I I just had one pop up in my crown tail placots though, yeah. which I had never seen before. Um, that was strange. Well, well in, in my opinion, black orchids are, are black lace uh, fish. So they are, yeah, black lace, black, with, with, and they usually have an iridescent layer. Um, Often this is steel blue based, but it can of course also be royal blue or turquoise. I mean, the the iridescent genetics then works the same as what we, um, yeah, how how, how iridescent uh, is is inherited, and the black. I mean, it, I think they will breed true if you will have two, well, fish which are both black lace. So if you could turn, if you cross black to black, you also get black offspring. Um, but then of course, if the black type is also uh, of the similar, um, how do you say, it, of the similar type, yeah, because we also can have Milano blacks, and that's a different kind of story. I mean, they will not, they will not give you black if you breed them together. Um, I can show you uh, something from my own uh, spawn, which I did recently. Uh, this is beginning of this year in January. So what I have, um, so I think you can see it now. This is a, a black male, steel blue black lace. It's almost completely black, but in the finish you see still some some metallic, uh, some steel blue iridescence. Uh, and he came from a black lace from which I got from Bettina Sparrow from Germany with a steel blue uh, male from my my own line. Um, and I crossed him with a female, which was also yeah also black lace, but not that intense black as the male, uh, but still also shows this this blue iridescence. And he came actually, she came from the same male, but then crossed to a spawn sister, to a royal blue female. So that means that both of these parents must have been carrying black lace, because now you also see that that has been popping up in both cases, in both spawns. So what happens when I cross these together? In this case, I got all black fry. So all the offspring of this, and you see a little bit of red, and I see some pictures do not work, sorry for that. Um, Maybe. Um, okay. But I can show the video. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder why so it's not here you see some uh, here you see some males. I mean the males are intense black black colored. They do show some iridescence, and that's not really surprising when you look at the background. I mean they come from my iridescent line, so they do show some iridescence on the on on their 
on the on the tails and, and, and also a bit of the dorsal and the anal fin. But in this case, I mean, I got all blacks from the line, and some of them actually are mar. There are two of them who are now marbling. Um, I think there's one of them in the video also here. See? Wow. Uh, this is a black and white, but he turned a bit more black now already, but he's still showing these wider patches. But you can still see that, yeah, they these are considered to be black lace because they are, yeah, they showing quite some iridescence in their uh, in their finish. So, yeah, I think it's a um, when you are working with two fish, you are carrying the same type, so black lace and also the same type of iridescence. In my opinion, you should get black back. Um, I don't know if that answers answers the questions a little bit. Yeah, I think. Uh, I mean, just me finding that one black orchid. I mean, he's right back there somewhere. Um, <laughs> and my recent spawn that was all metallic. You know, like if you look at my spawn logs for the past three or four generations, it was all metallic, either copper, turquoise, or whatever, just a solid metallic fish. And then all of a sudden, I got a black orchid. So um, that it's definitely one that can hide a lot and come out of iridescent or metallic lines, just. It doesn't seem random, though. If all of your fish were black, that's cool. Yeah, but it depends. I mean, see, if you in your in your case, I mean, that's the same. Like suddenly a white fish can appear, or suddenly a black fish can appear. I mean, when you are working just with you know crossing crossing fish, and it it can be that one of the fish is carrying, but the other one is not. So the gene can still be passed on within your offspring, but it cannot. It does not show phenotypically because it needs to be homozygous to be shown in some cases. So it can still be that the, the gene is passed on through generations uh, and then suddenly you can have a black fish pop up because then at that time you have been selecting two siblings who were also both carrying um, the same trait. And that's something which sometimes, uh, yeah, it, it's not always that all the fish of the spawn carry the same background. I mean, you still are, um, you are still, um, uh, you have to be a little bit lucky that you select two fish from that spawn who are also both carrying then the same black type. And that's not always easy. And that's probably what happens with your crown tail plucker. You're breeding for several generations, but you work with, I think they were copper and blue, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. which the ones which, which you are working with. So they might have been carrying it, but then one of the fish might have passed it on to each generation. But now you have selected then maybe two parents who have been, uh, two breeders who have been carrying it both, and then something uh -huh. pops up. So. That, that, yeah, that might be going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it is really interesting how that stuff pops up. Let's see. Definitely. That's actually the, the nice part. Yeah. Let's see. So Kyle is asking a question. When breeding bettas and truly all fish, are there any, what is it, non-visible traits we should look for to cull other than, the other than bent spines? Non-visible. That'd be hard to see if you can't see it. Uh, sorry? I, I was just reading Kyle's question. When breeding bettas and truly all fish, are there any non-visible traits we should look for to cull? Example, other than bent spines. So I guess, but I mean, if, it, if you can't see it, that's really hard to cull for because mm. visibly the fish will look fine but might be carrying possibly deleterious traits so yeah that's a tough one i guess you just kind of keep going for what you're going for right like uh if you go back to our previous conversations about selectively breeding bettas you just selectively breed for the fish that um are carrying the traits you want but it can be hard to tell what they're carrying if you don't know the background of the fish i guess is that oh. one way to keep it clean <laughs> or to keep it uh, to answer that question I see a nice one uh, coming up from Carlos he says wow. something about, about gold Do you see it yeah I, gold. I think that's a nice subject to touch <laughs> I mean gold we all want gold gold fever I mean <laughs> he says a uh, gold I just started working with this line what future outcrosses would you suggest to in intensify the gold color uh, that's that's a that's a really good question because that's I think like the uh, holy grail right now is how do I get more gold? <laughs> how do you get more gold? I mean, this is this is something which is not easy. I mean, this is a 
this is difficult stuff. <laughs> um, I can. Uh, Do you have yeah. like a picture of one of Kai's gold bettas? Yeah, yeah I will. Gold. Give me a, a small one. Okay, so the gold color for people that oh, while well, Yup is looking for the, the pictures, um, it seems to me that there's several different kinds of gold, but they appear to be coming out of like playing with this metallic gene. Would you agree, Yup? Like, I do, I do, I do. Metallic. Yeah, and um, it definitely interplay of metallic in there, but um. So Stacy had an amazing gold fish, and I'd never seen one in person because they're really hard to photograph, like going all the way back to our beginning of our conversation, how fish can look different under different light. Gold seems to be particularly difficult to photograph. And then Stacy had a beautiful gold male, and she actually sent it to me so that I could see it in person. And this fish changes color. Like, it's a beautiful color, but it, it seems to, like, change under different light different quality of light can give it a different color. Um, so getting like that intense gold is going to be difficult because under different un under different light, it's going to look different intensity, if that makes sense. <laughs> so, um, but Kai, uh, Kai Betamas, he's active on like the Betas for All forums and on the Betas for All Facebook. Uh, I believe he's in Malaysia. Am I correct? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he has some gorgeous, gorgeous gold Betas that they kind of shine um, in sunlight. Like he takes pictures of them out in natural light and they just yeah. shine beautiful gold colors. So, um, yeah. Um, I, I found some, uh, some pictures. Let's see. Um, so, this is, these are some, uh, some golds I'll share now. Um, so, these are some golds spread by, uh, by Kai. Um, yeah, and, okay. Uh, I really love their intensity. So when you look at, I mean, this is these are of course are made in a tank, and here they are lying on his hand. And I'll show you a few more. So you really see that there is an intense layer. Of course, there are. Uh, you see that there is the pictures are made with some light, uh, but even when they are on the hand, they are really intense yellow, with a with a with a really metallic goldish uh, sheen. And this is this is really intense. Um, and um, well, here's some more examples. Um, this fish, actually, I, I got from him um, a few years back, and I was uh, I was trying to uh, work with that. Hi, boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> hi. <You're good> here. <laughs> <laughs> here. Say hi. Hi, Michael. <laughs> you probably can tell. Where did I go? <laughs> <You're good. laughs> So um, <laughs> let me go back. Um, Bye. 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 <laughs> Bye. So in the beginning, I um, I, um, I I got this fish. I got a, a, a well, a gold, a really intense gold uh, female, which was not finish wise was not really really that that great. But I was able to um, to also get a gold male at the time, and this was back in 2013. And I crossed these fish together, and the offspring. Well, I was very happy with it, but. When I looked and they when they matured, they did not come close to the intensity. And here I played a bit with the different lightning, as you can see. This is the same fish, but then with different kinds of light. And I can even make it white. <laughs> and I could make it really wow. dragon kai. I could make it gold. So I, I played a little bit with, with, with different. Uh, it's the same fish, but just different light above the tank or in front of the tank or with a uh, with a small uh, uh, um, flashlight. And you could. Picture it, whatever you want. I mean, I would, you just want to sell it, <laughs> but yeah. this was not really the color you would see. I mean, the, the color, if you see them, was more like this. So you saw that they were a bit of, you definitely saw that there was a gold shine over these fish, and they weren't white. There was something yellowish metallic as well, but they weren't the intense golds as what we what I saw when I uh, first got these first, um, um, when I got these first uh, female from Kai. So. I continued this line, but I never got these intense golds back. Uh, what I did now, uh, and this is um, actually beginning of the well, end of last year, I got a yellow male uh, from Thailand, and I got a nice yellow, uh, well, a gold female, and I crossed these together. I thought, hey, let's see if we can work on intensity by infusing, yeah, yellow into it. No idea if the gold also was carrying yellow or not, and 
well, the result is not like that. So it's not like that you get intense yellow fish. What I more got was more like pastel type of uh, fish, which are, um, um, yeah, which are carrying, so heterozygous for the metallic trait, they are carrying yellow. They do show a little bit yellow when you when you see them live, but they are far from intense yellow like the like the father, and definitely also not gold like the mother. I also did not expect that because they are carriers. And with these fish, I am continuing now. So what I did is I crossed a female from this line back to a gold male, um, and I do see some gold back now. Um, but I didn't. Um, I need to look for the picture. Because I, I, I haven't uh, I haven't updated that spawn up yet. But what I do see is I get two types of offspring. So I cross one of these types back to a gold. I see this type back, so a bit of a pastel type of yeah, pastel type of uh, yellow slash gold carrier. And I see the gold color back, but I cannot say anything about intensity. So mm -hmm. far, they look like um, yeah, a little bit like this. So when you what you see here. So the golds, the other ones really look like pastel fish. So they're both types in the offspring. Do you think um, you could try like copper with that? Well, you could. I think uh, there is um in the States, there is this um, woman, she's called, I think, Janie Chan. Am I correct? She, I, uh, I, I, I talked to her on Facebook uh, a while back and she, she was doing some really nice, um, she was doing some crosses where she actually, and I have to look, maybe I can find it. Um, she actually crossed, I think, dark or yellow into the into gold, and then she was working with this, and this her results were really stunning. I mean, she really got with dark body golds. Um, well, she got really intense golds back also, uh, but I haven't seen any updates lately, so I don't know what's going on. I don't know if she's still continuing the line or not. Sorry. That's interesting. Yeah. Because like for me, like I really, I think my holy grail fish would be a, you know, a crown tail placot with bright gold. Yeah. <laughs> like I thought about crossing in gold at different points, but you know, that's just anytime you have a line and then you add something different, it's going to take like three generations to settle back out again, you know, so um but I thought about it. That would be really, really beautiful, I think. I can, I can have a quick look if I can find uh, the topic uh, I was talking about with the goals. Maybe I can find the picture. Um, we, had, we had a discussion on our... Um, uh, my uh, computer doesn't want to... Work with me. <laughs> Trying to find it, but yeah, I think gold is one of those new variations that's just really beautiful, and we still don't know everything about it, like what makes that super intense gold, other than just the light. <laughs> um, it's one of those colors that, like, you are able to see looks completely different under different light sources. But um, getting that intense gold, we really don't know the answer to that perfectly quite yet. Um, but yeah, that would be a really cool one to work with. So I wish you good luck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, try. I mean, I think it's really try, try, try. And uh, don't be afraid to outcross. I think this is something and work with it. I mean, don't expect to get the result in, in one generation because, yeah, you probably won't. But I think, um, yeah, working with it, I mean, you can really, really get some interesting results. And, and yeah, continue it. Try to work with it. Um, let's see, I think I found... Did you um, find it? Yeah, I think I found what I was looking for. I will, yeah, um, I will show this. This is a... Uh, one second. So this is, uh, this is on Facebook. Um, so this is, this is actually shared in a topic we had about crossing gold to yellow. And this is from, uh, from Janie Chan. Um, and she, um, what she showed here that, that she crossed actually, uh, uh, well, also a gold to um, gold to gold, and then she had a, a gold offspring which she crossed to a dark body yellow, so a pineapple kind of female. 
uh, with a nice intense yellow finish. And then she got like offspring, which looked a little bit like my fish. Uh, so it was a bit, a bit of a pastel type of, but already a bit more, I think, yellow in there. And then she crossed it, I think, back to the to the pineapple. And then this this fish already got way more intensity. So you saw that there is this already a, a, some kind of a gold phenotype coming out of there. I think she showed it a bit better be, better here. Mm -hmm. okay. This actually is this is not bad. I mean, I I like this. I mean, if I could get this type of gold, I would be very I would be very proud. So maybe this is the way to go. I don't know. Um, and I, I really would like to see what what happened after this, um, but I don't know. But Dark this body, is body yellow. Well, this is this is this is light body, but but I can imagine that maybe. I mean, I do this for my reds as well. I like to cross dark body to to light body to maintain intensity of the red color, um, also to get better Cambodians for for showing. But I do really like the dark body fish, um, and. I can imagine that this might work for yellow and orange in a similar way. Um, but hey, this is speculating, so we also don't know it all, right? I mean, that's that's yeah. we, we all should try, and that's what we do here. We are sharing. We're not saying this is the way you should do it. We are saying try, and we are just giving our opinion how it might work. <laughs> well, not just try, but document. Like Exactly. That's very important. Take pictures. Like, I, I'm share. very bad at taking pictures. Like I <laughs> should take more pictures, but um, yeah, need to document the whole process and take pictures so that we can all share it and learn more from the evidence. You know, speaking as two biologists would, <laughs> right? <Yeah>. Evidence. <laughs> evidence. Evidence is. is uh, I think sharing indeed is is the most important thing. I mean, if, if you can um, if you can get a fish from a breeder and you know what's in there, I mean, this can give you already a, a huge advantage. And if you are together with a with a breeder group, I mean, with a certain hobbyists who, who meet each other at shows, and you know that some people are working on similar goals, I mean, then it's really nice if you can share some of the fish together. I mean, you can because you only have a limited number of spawns which you usually can do within your fish room because you have a number a limited number of jars, you have a limited number of time. And we're not professional fish breeders. We're we're just hobbyists. And okay, in some fish rooms it got a little bit out of hand, but uh, <laughs> in others yeah, I mean some anyway. like yours. Um <laughs> no, but most of us we we, uh, we still have a we have a job and we are we're not earning our money with betas. I mean we're we're doing this from a hobby hobbyist perspective. And I think what is really nice is that if you then can share, because together you can achieve way more than what you can do alone. And if you can then get one of these nice carriers back from one of your breeder friends, and you can share uh, some fish of your project with other people who are working the same, it also gives you backup. Um, and sometimes maybe in two years you need something to, to outcross because you have lost a certain trait. You can get it back because it's partly related to your line. And this is very, very valuable. And when you then have somebody who also documented what he or, her or she has been doing with the line, this is very important. And this can be very, very valuable for your uh, future goals, I think. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Share, share, share. Share fish. Exactly, exactly. Share pictures. Share, you know, what you're crossing with. Share everything. Oh, I see here. I see here that, that Jackie says that Janie lost her fish. Oh, um, no. Uh, that, that would be very sad. That's, uh, like there's a lot of I don't know I I just ran into disease lately and it's disease is the worst like it's oh, horrible if that happens terrible oh, yeah I don't want to think about that like <laughs> when it happens it happens though now, these things are, are are really frustrating I mean that's the same as you know um, we all have, have these periods for instance that the fish just sit, don't, don't want to spawn I mean this is something which which happens and it also happens to me I mean um, I have these periods that most of the time and I'm, I think I'm lucky that seven eight months per year I mean most of the fish which I put in a spawn tank they will spawn yeah but I do have these periods where they really do not want to spawn and I cannot force them to to do it so it's like then I just you need you just need to wait and sit out that period and what is what is going on? I have no idea because I'm always doing the same already for 15 years. I'm not changing anything. I mean, I feed the same. I, I, I condition them the same. I, the, the, 
the way my, my spawning tents are, tanks are uh, decorated is the same, temperature is the same. Mm -hmm. The only thing I can imagine that, that something happens with, you know, the weather, the, the, the humidity, maybe something with the water, you know, the water company might change something. Yeah. Uh, and that, that's something which I can imagine. Yeah, actually, I think that's what is happening to me. Um, San Francisco is changing water sources as they're trying to right. fix like, 15 year old, 30 year old pipelines. I forget how old they are, but um, so my water source is changing, and I can definitely tell like my fish don't like it. So I'm, I'm actually considering an RO unit, mm -hmm. um, you know, because they, whatever is in the tap water is, is not sitting well with my fish. So, and sometimes there are things like outside of your control, like weather. <laughs> Maybe they're sensing like a barometric, like pressure change or something. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, I mean, we cannot. Yeah, we cannot rule that out. I mean, this is something. Uh, I mean, we can only, yeah, uh, give the best care as possible. Um, but they are not machines. I mean, they are they are fish and they are live animals, and we have to take care of them. And we have to. I mean, they have to be in proper condition. I mean, it's the same. Why do they eat eggs, or why don't they? Yeah. I mean, I have perfect fathers turning into egg eaters, and egg eaters turning into perfect fathers. And this is, in my opinion, also something which, uh, yeah. I always leave them there and never hatch artificially. It's just it, when it doesn't work, it doesn't work, and then I try another one. That, mm -hmm. That's how I do it. But again, this yeah. is some, everybody has to decide that for him or herself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Uh, oh, Amanda Richards has an interesting one. Dumbo pectoral fins seem to be more fragile than other fins on the same fish. Any thoughts? Yeah. Um, yeah, this, this is a this is a very interesting one. I think um, I I don't have myself. I don't have really a lot of experience with Dumbo's. Um, I did work a little bit with a well. I think in 2012 or something like that. I, I found one in a in a pet shop here, and I thought, hey, let's see how this how this works. Uh, see if I can uh, breed it and see what happens. Um, I only bred one generation because then uh, all the I only got females. Um, so it makes it a bit hard to continue. Um, but what I also noticed is that, that yeah, they are uh, way more fragile. And I also do see it with the fish at our shows. When I see fish which have Dumbo pectorals, oh, well, it's rarely that they are intact. So usually you see that yeah. they are ripped or that they are pretty damaged. What I do see that also is it's not only the pectorals. I mean, when you do look at some of the the fins. I mean, sometimes it seems that in certain colors, and I, I can remember that this actually happens with some of the salamander type of fish. That it seems to be that they are more fragile, and it's not with every lion, but it's it's it seems to be that with some lions, you see that the yeah, the finish tends to melt away or something easier than than what happens with with other lions. And it, in my opinion, that sometimes also is going on with these. Uh, they seem to be have weaker finish or something. I don't know if I can really find a picture there um, but I've talked to other breeders about this phenomenon too. sorry I've noticed that too back way back when I was doing crown tail double tails the fish that had clear um, like clear fins tended mm. to have weaker rays oh here we go okay so we're going back here and then this connects to another question that I was looking at in the chat room talking about the integrity of rays. Did you see that question too? Um, like no. someone was asking about how to have stronger rays in crown tails. Um, so that ties in nicely to this question. Oh, here, Amanda Richards, any tips for nice, strong CT rays? And I obsessed over that when I was trying to do my long fin crown tail double tails. Um, anyway, so here, so these are brothers, okay? This is way back, 2013. No, not way back, but whatever. Um, so you can see that the rays that have clear pigment, they tended to like crinkle up like this. And it was so, so frustrating to have this constant like fin curling. Whereas like this sister that had ray, um, red on the, um, the rays here, you can see she had clear, strong rays that resisted fin curling. And I saw this again and again, that um, fish that had this clear pigmentation or clear 
uh, color on their rays tended to also get the broken, like here's a broken ray over here. This guy was just all kinked up and curled and, you know, it looked like he went through the shredder kind of. Um, so, and, and this is all the same spawn, same genetics, same everything. It's just that it seemed like the fish that had the clear rays tended to have the broken and curled rays. So I, I definitely see that observation that you made you. So I don't know if you also have pictures like that, but yeah, we, that was very uh, telling and very frustrating. And they were the same good. water condition, same everything, but all the fish that had like red or blue on those um, crown tail rays had perfectly straight rays. And then the ones that were clear had all the fin curling and broken rays. So uh, I cannot not I cannot confirm that it's always with the with the complete uh, colorless ones because for instance with my plockouts I do have fish which sometimes turn cellophane or something like that but I cannot really say that they are weaker but I do see it with some of I don't know I don't know how to explain it because I don't really have a good picture but I I've talked to some other judges also in our shows which we have we sometimes see it that 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 we see fish which have I don't know, they are of a certain butterfly type and then for instance in placards where they are, um, yeah, a bit of a salamander type of, of uh, with a butterfly edge and, the, and they seem to be, um, yeah, I don't know, very, they seem to be a little bit weaker where they, where the finish seems to, uh, the edges seem to, to melt away easier or something like that. I cannot really explain it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and yeah, with the ground tails, I mean, this is a difficult thing. I mean, this is uh, how to get them straight, how to get them. I mean, this is this is difficult. Um, also, I'm not. I, did, I have, have limited amount of experience with with ground tails myself because I only worked with them when I uh, made a ground tail plucker line back in 2012. But um, I do see that a lot of breeders around around me here are, are struggling with it. Sometimes they have no problems, and you see really really nice uh, straight great crown tails uh, but I also see that sometimes when they do an outcross or something like that they have similar water and then that spawn curls and the other one doesn't so why does that happen I mean that seems to be maybe genetics that seems to be uh, that the one is more prone to to curl than the other but this is yeah this is a very interesting question um, uh, but I cannot really answer it in the sense from my own experience so I can uh, tell you a whole story but it doesn't, yeah, I can't, it's better to just say that I cannot really answer this question. Yeah, and, and there's all sorts of like speculation, like, um, you know, when I was trying to find a, an answer to it because I was tired of my long fin crown tails curling like that, you know, some people swore with direct sunlight, like taking your fish out and putting them in the sun. <laughs> you know, other fish, um, we see people here talking about calcium and bone meal powder and that kind of stuff so maybe that would help but again no definitive answer and i mean this fin curling issue that i was having with my long fin crown tails was one of the major reasons why i switched to the short fin placot or the, yeah the short fin crown tails because i hardly ever get bent or curled rays um with the fish that have the short rays they just i mean shorter more structural integrity i mean that's a physics thing so um but for the long fin rays why they curl there's a lot going on so. well i think you can, can i mean i think this is a nice comparison i think it's the same with with half moons i mean uh when you look at long fins and half moons and short fin half moons i mean curling in a pluck up that's that's pretty rare i mean i, I rarely see that but curling in a half moon. I mean, I see people who don't have any problems and always have really nice straight half moons which are balanced, which are, you know, great quality. But there are also people who then buy from, from the same person and, and try to do the same. They talk to each other. They, they try to level up with all the things they do. But still, they have different water or they live in a different city or a different area or a different country even. <laughs> and and they, they, they share the same genetics, basically in the same, because they're working with the same fish, but still one of them still has, you know, curled rays or the dorsals, they flap when they, when they, the fish turns into show age uh, or, or, that, or this, this anal fin just doesn't, you know, just doesn't stay straight. So why does that happen? I mean, that seems to be that there is something more in the environment than that it might be genetically uh, there. But in some cases, it might be genetic as well. And, and this is very difficult. Mm -hmm. Because we cannot really rule it out. We can only try and 
maybe yeah, when when you give uh, when you use harder water or calcium uh, in in the water or something like that i mean this might definitely be um yeah be something i mean um try it and share again <laughs> yeah <And> share <laughs> cuz it would be imp i mean it would be possible to have like that kind of experiment you know that where you have all the fish same genetics and then change one variable right like hard water, soft water, or feeding one spawn um, calcium enriched food and another without calcium enriched food. But then you get back to like what you said earlier, you we all have like limited number of jars, limited number of fish we can spawn. Yeah. Or a limited yeah. number of fish we could experiment with. Yeah, but this is very difficult. I mean I, I mean this is this is very difficult also to do an experiment like that. I mean and we can easily think about these kind of experiments, but to really do it in a good way, I mean this is not that easy. I mean if you would do it, I mean, I would even prefer to do it maybe with, with fish from the same spawn and yeah. then maybe split it up. You know, if you if you then use one spawn where you put the enriched food and the other one, the other half of the spawn, you would not put, put the, the, the calcium enriched food, something like that. Um, but you have to be really controlling all the other uh, variables that you are not doing things differently. Um, that's this, this can be difficult, but you cannot base this on two or three fish and also not on one spawn, I think. Yeah. But it definitely can give you a hint. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, but it, I will say, fin curling is like the most frustrating thing to me. <laughs> yeah, it is. I mean, yeah, it's the same as disease. I mean, this is something which is uh, not nice. Mm -hmm. Let's see. What's another question? Man, is it getting late there, you? Um, let me check it. I, I clicked something strange. Oh, uh, well, it's it's uh, 10 30 here. I'm, yeah, I'm, uh, okay. I'm just saying, I'm starting to get hungry, but you know, <laughs> I haven't started my day yet. I mean, this is a great way to start my day. So, um, but, I mean, we can uh, we can continue us another time. I mean, no problem. I mean, it's uh, I think we covered some nice subjects and. If you, if you're, if you, is there still some questions which we still want to, we want to uh, do? Then no problem. How about we do one or two more questions? Yeah. That's good. Good. So let's see. You can choose. You're the chief. I'm the because chief. It, you're like. I'm dad. catching a mosquito here so now because it, I'm hunted by <laughs> mosquitoes. Sorry. <laughs> Wait, you have mosquitoes? Yeah. Oof. Yep. Um, okay. Gosh, I want to visit. I'm going to do an awesome fish room tour of your place if I ever get to visit. <laughs> You're welcome. More than <laughs> welcome. Be, like all nice and put music to it. And Metallica. And Metallica. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But then we get into we get into problem pro problems because we are using their music probably. <laughs> okay, here. Um. So. Uh, oh my goodness! I am not gonna say your name correctly, but Space Michelle Adachet is asking, can you guys comment something on true green betas? So we kind of talked about it earlier. So um, Space Michelle Adachet, if you go all the way to the beginning, um. After this live stream is over, of course, you can rewatch it. And we do touch on green quite a bit. And like, what is green? What kind of green? How you can get to green? So we did talk about that. Um, like, what is a true green? So Amanda Richards is asking question on diamond eye on a dragon scale. Do you find it dominant or hit and miss? I've started waiting till breeders get older to avoid it, but I still find it hit and miss. So um, I'm guessing like diamond eye would be like the covering the um, expansion the pigmentation over the eye. Yeah. Um, do you have pictures of that? Um, you because you you worked a lot with that, right? Like um, the, the um, not diamond eye dragons and metallics in general. Like I see them yeah, yeah. at shows a lot. Well, we do see them regularly, but we are also very strict in in well disqualifying them. So in the sense that uh, here, here in Europe, I mean, I think the IBC does the same. I think that they, when they really cover the eye, then I mean, the fish is disqualified for having alien eyes. Uh -huh. uh, 
in, in, in inheritance, I mean, see, it's always, we always, we all want to work with the perfect fish. Uh, that, that's always what we want. But sometimes we just simply don't have these perfect fish. And then sometimes you just have to work with the fish which are available to you. And that means that in some cases, I can also imagine that people work with fish showing these alien eyes. Mm -hmm. That does not really mean that, that, that immediately when you don't have another choice, that you really, that you all get these alien eyes back. It's the same with, with, you know, with, with top lines, etc. You can, actually do a lot by selective breeding and and um what, what you i think do have to realize is that when you have a fish showing this this alien eyes i mean i would not cross it to a to a fish which is from the same line or i would not cross it to a heavily metallic female uh, assuming that the alien eye is now a male uh, i would not i would not um do that because then i think you increase really the risk of of of, of, um, of getting these alien eyes back I think what you should do is is then more or less dilute the the dragon slash metallic layer, and I think that's something which you can do by by crossing it to a non a non metallic type of fish, maybe even right? you could cross it to a red or a, or a yellow, and of course you might introduce some different colors. Uh, but with selective breeding, I mean, you can always get back to what you what you want. I mean that this is, but it will take time. Um, I think you do a right job in, in, in selecting your breeding your breeders when they mature. I mean this is something I think which which is very important. I mean I mean we can breed our fish with three or four months of age. Uh, but we so we often do not really see what characteristics um, will still develop when these fish matures. And we all want to have fish which you know uh, are throughout their whole lives balanced and, and do not show uh, certain traits which we do not want to continue. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you're already doing a, a great job there by, by, by looking at these fish when they are mature. Um, and then, I mean, if you have the choice, I mean, I would try to, cro yeah, try to work with the fish which do not show it. But of course, they are always the best fish which show these negative traits. I mean, oh. it's for us the same. I mean, <laughs> when I have the best finish on the fish, it shows a worse top line or something like that. You know, it's always a matter of choice. Um, and sometimes not not working with the with the uh, that show winner can still give you really really nice offspring. So um, and maybe experiment. You know when you when you continue the line by breeding uh, uh, an alien eye fish to a, a fish which less with with less metallic coverage, you can also do maybe an outcross crossing the same male to for instance a non-metallic uh, um, female, and then work further from there because then you will have multiple options to work with. And you have more chances by diluting this this uh, negative trait, and maybe get, even get rid of this negative tra trait. So this is something where you can, I think, we, how you could approach it. But again, this there will be multiple ways to do this. There will, are people who say do not do not even touch these these alien eyes, and other people say I think you could, like me, I think you can de definitely work with it, but be careful and keep selecting. Mm -hmm. um, Carefully. Yeah I, yeah, I agree that it seems like the fish that have the heaviest metallic or dragon or opaque coverage, those are the fish that tend to get that coverage that extends over their face into their eye. Like it, it always seems to be those fish. So, anyway. Yep. yep. Okay. So, I'm sorry, guys. I'm getting really hungry. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't want to like get hangry. <laughs> so. <laughs> and we suddenly hear Whoa, 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 I know. Do, you, do you say that too that people get hangry like when they're hungry they're angry <laughs> oh, I like it I, we can keep that in <laughs> learn something <laughs> <laughs> next time I'll bring snacks so I can keep nice. <laughs> share with me as well I will send you some fish food <laughs> <Bio fish>. <laughs> <laughs> so Okay, so I think we're going to start winding down. So um, even though we got 62 viewers, I'm not seeing so many questions. So um, I guess you and I tend to ramble on about certain questions. So that makes sense. Um, <laughs> anyway, thank you, you for coming on to, uh, to this live stream again. We should try and have one more before school starts. When does school start for you? I just started my holiday, so this is actually my first weekend of holiday. So I start in um, actually the Monday after our show, so that that will be totally crap. I mean, I will uh, <laughs> I, I will start on the Monday after we had uh, a long weekend of uh, 
judging betas and having fun with a lot of better people. Oh my um, God. But it will be one week without students still. So it will be one week to, you know, to level with all my colleagues and then we will start again. So, yeah. yeah. My students don't show up until August 21st, but I go back to... That's the same for me. Well, the same, I started August 21st, but then I have a, a student less week still. So. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Okay, so we're on the same schedule. So we both know what it's like. <laughs> <laughs> to start the school year. I like kind of don't want my summer to end, but I also miss my students. So, you know, feel the same way. I, I miss well, them. Thank you again for uh, inviting me, uh, Jan. And uh, yeah, let's, let's do this again. Yes, we right. shall be in contact. So. Alrighty. Good luck with your research, huh? <laughs> oh, yeah. We'll see what happens. <laughs> it will so, be fun. Yeah. Keep sharing. Yes, I will. So anyway, so everyone's saying thank you. No, thank you guys for coming because we wouldn't hold these live streams if we didn't know that people wanted to uh, to have these live streams. So um, we'll have to come up with the next topic. I don't know. We'll like brainstorm a bit about what the next one should be. Um, people are saying that they love our rambling. Thanks, Princess Lunchbox. So, oh my gosh, Jimmy. Jimmy, were you like lurking the entire time? <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, thank you all for coming. You guys are what make this live stream happen. I just, you know, do the background work of getting you on here. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, I guess that finishes it. So, thank, thank you guys for all for coming. So, thank you. Okay, so let me stop the broadcast. Okay, goodbye. Bye. Have a wonderful day.